So let me just say one thing before you start asking questions, because I'd like to hear some maybe observations on this. So it seems to me that there are a couple of very important continuum that Mark talked about that are in discussion generally in the community. One is the idea of whether we should be photographing exemplars in high quality images of uh, one or two specimens out of a lot or even a larger group of specimens versus doing a high throughput robotic work or whatever. And then the other one is um, how rapidly are we moving toward field uh, digitization, so that we're beginning to get digitization done, not only of images, but of data, so that when we get back to the lab, a good bit of our workflow is completed, as opposed to spending a lot of our time doing legacy data, which is kind of what we're all about right now, trying to catch up. Um, and I'm just wondering about those two ends and what, you know, what it means to us in collections, um, you know, which end of that we should fall on. Or, I think your your talk certainly highlighted both ends of that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I, I like taking photos of fish, so I'm on the side of I'm not worried about. I, I try and take yeah. I, um, I'm trying to get a really good photo of fish. I'm not worried about high throughput. Although I try and take as many photos of fish as I can. Um, I'm looking for the best fish. It might not be representative. It, you know, it might be one that has unique conditions. So that's that's that end of the scale, and other people might want to operate that way too. But um, I'm also involved in project with Kyle, trying to image all of our type specimens. So these these are specimens upon which the taxonomic name is based. Again, you want to maximize the image of that, and you want to maximize mac, maximize the accuracy of that image. So those are images that I, I wouldn't doctor. In other words, you want to stay true to that specimen. You want to get its multiple views. You want to get close-ups of uh, different teeth or different parts of it. That. Yeah. Well, I was just <coughs> curious. One, uh, two questions. One, being an entomologist, I'm not sure in ichthyology how much field identification you do. Do you already know what it is when you're taking the picture? And two, this I, I appreciate the, this hyper realism. Uh, taking images of specimens in the wild or in water. They're beautiful, they're gorgeous, they're diagnostic. Um, but it begs the question of what image do you need? Of the specimen as if you were scuba diving in the creek? Right. Or the specimen as it appears to you in a jar and things? Right. And did you take it before and after? It's like, well, this is what it would like, but when you get to it, it's going to look like this. Right, right, yeah. I've done uh, I've done images I didn't have in this slide, but, but just pictures that show that like here here came right out of the stream and here it is um, you know five years later or so after it's been preserved in the jar. But did you see the differences between that? Um, well, in answer to your first question, the, in terms of field IDs, it varies. It varies really. Those the, the fish that I was photographing in my hand that were collecting up in the Andes. I didn't know how many species we were dealing with, I, uh, and we still don't really know. So in that case, because I didn't know what I was photographing, I was just trying to get as many specimens photographed in my hand as possible to preserve the, the light coloration, so then I could, at a later date, um, we ended up sequencing a lot of those so I can coordinate color patterns with uh, gene trees, basically. Um, but then there are other cases where I do know what uh, what what the, what I'm, the fishes I can identify in the field, and then I'm selecting things either based on their aesthetics or for a project I'm working on, or uh, it's more yeah, it's more kind of geared, geared towards that one. Uh, so there's both sides to that. The hyper realism thing for fishes, we'll never be able to beat the aquarium community. I mean, if you go on Catfish Planet or something like that, those people just as much time as I put into my photo tank and taking pictures of fishes in the field, they put five times, ten times as much time getting those perfect shots of the catfish swimming around their tank, swimming around. Uh, they usually have live plants, but you know, nice peat gravel or a piece of driftwood in the background. So I guess I don't worry so much about trying to capture. Um, the fish, the way it looked like swimming on that reef, because the aquarium people or scuba divers will capture that data. I'm 
I'm going for mostly just that perfect lateral view of the fish in its all its glory, glorious color, um, with the fins nicely spread out, and um, that maximizes the information content of that particular specimen. Does that answer your question? More or less. I'm just wondering how many folks are going to come afterwards and look at the specimen of the jar here. This is the same damn thing. You know, I mean, it, it would be nice if you have this is a, a, a Excellent exemplar right. of this taxon, but ten years later, when you go look at it, this is what it's going to look like. Right. You know, right. So people understand that you know, this is not what if they go into a collection and the undetermined stuff. They're pulling stuff out of jars. It's not going to look like what you took a picture. Of. No, it's not. It's not. And I've gone through that exercise with when I've been in the field and wasn't diligent about taking a picture of the specimen with the tag, or it was late at night, or. Whatever, and I just like, I'll just throw it in the formaldehyde, and then five years later, I'm like, wow, that's a really good picture. And then I have to go, go, go find that dish in the jar or my collection or somebody else's collection. Uh, it's hard. And then because, because of those changes, um, generally you can match them. You use pigmentation patterns or whatever to match them up. But um, yeah, they, they, they do definitely change. But most of the time, you can still match them up. Uh, I just think it would be, it would be interesting to have the comparative photographs. Yeah. People who are doing museum work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, if you're looking for this fish, this is what's what it's This is what you want to look for at this point. Yep. Yep. Yeah. One of the big problems that we deal with with fish is obviously you get the feel. Yeah. What techniques do you use to ensure that you get the entire specimen in in focus, especially if you're the Right. He's gonna talk about that. Okay. And we're gonna uh, we'll demonstrate that too. It's uh yeah, there's different, there's different tricks for that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that, yeah. Yeah, let's play the dog and try to know we can get him. Get him the best time. Okay. All right. Um, I'll apologize, my talk is not going to be nearly as dynamic as Mark's voice. Um, in my defense, he had my talk before he started his, so I'm sure you tried it out doing Um So I'm going to be talking about type imaging at the Academy and focusing on the the software we use to aid our photography um, and the digital editing. Um, so we've seen these pictures before, uh, Mark showed them there. Um, the, the basic goals of our project were to photograph all the primary type specimens, radiograph all of those specimens, um, edit the images and format them for the web, upload the images and the metadata to the types website, um, and then secondarily verify the type status um, and replace faulty lids and guards and pop-off ethanol before the specimens were returned to the collection. Um, our proposed workflow, um, we had, had initially intended to transport the specimens from the collection, grabbing about a shelf at a time, taking them down, um, then verifying the type of information before photographing them, uh, photograph one lot at a time in at least the lateral view. Um, if the dorsal and ventral view was appropriate, we would also do that. Um, and then after it was photographed, insert a label that said image by so-and-so on the stage. Um, and then we would take those specimens, do a radiograph, usually one view in lateral view, um, or a dorsal ventral view if, if needed, or if um, the specimen didn't warrant a lateral view. And then enter the data into the collection database. And then once all those lots were imaged, we move all those images over to the server, then take the jars, replace the lids, top, up, top them off, um, and return them to the collection. And then we would complete image processing upload those images to the type website, and then just repeat that process with the next shell. What we ended up doing, um, we followed that for the most part, um, but there were a few things that we changed. Um, instead of transporting the specimens one shelf at a time, we ended up using multiple shells, taking specimens of a similar size. Um, when we verified the type information, we ended up checking that against the, the, the spreadsheet that we exported from our collection. Um, we have the advantage of having uh, a collection that's mostly database. Um, so this was, this was possible. We didn't have to actually database our specimens as we went along. Um, and then as we photographed them, we, we trashed the image by label, um, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, and then in between photography and doing the radiograph, we changed out the lid. Um, I'll talk about that shortly. Um, then radiograph them, and instead of the label, we're 
putting a black ribbon around the jar, just like the tech ribbons you usually see in a collection. Um, then um, moving things to the server. And then we would enter um, data for the photograph, the radiograph, um, and the photographer into that type spreadsheet so we know who, what had been done um, and who had done what. Um, replacing lids, topping off eth ethanol. Um, then we would complete image processing. And then after that, enter the metadata into the collection database, upload those images to the website, and then again repeat the process. Um, so the reason that we ended up taking specimens of similar size instead of just taking one shelf at a time is because we were finding that you would set up your shot and the first fish you might grab would have been a small fish. So you've got a small tripod, you're working up close. And you might have a bunch of those, but you eventually might get a larger fish that you have to swap out your rig. You know, you're switching to a larger tripod that's farther back. And that took time. Um, so to cut down on that, we just tried to pick specimens that would need their photograph with the small tripod or the, the large one and not worry about going and switching back and forth. Um, and then with that spreadsheet, um, that was exported from the collection database that helped us identify which lots needed to have further investigation as far as going back to the literature. We might have had, um, usually with instances of syntypes or um, holotype, paratype lots being mixed, we'd then have to consult the original description to find out which one was the, the holotype that we were going to photograph. Um, then with the labels, um, Making a label for each one just, it took too much time. You know, we saved probably a couple minutes on each each, um, each lot. So what we did instead was insert a, um, put that black label, or black ribbon around the jar, which is what we use in the general collection to identify a specimen that's been x-rayed. This also helped because when we put the specimens back in the collection, you knew which ones were done. Um, so if you went back, you weren't grabbing um, jars that had been done already. Um, and then we also found that it, it made more sense to change out the lid after you photographed it because you have to screw the lid on anyway to put it into the cube for, um, to be x-rayed. Uh, so we just had a, a supply of lids there and as, as we were done with the photographs, we just put the new lid on. Um, and then uh, once images were moved to the server, um, we actually placed them in folders like you saw that Mark had where um, it wasn't necessarily the, the individual <coughs> Um, specimen folder, but all those folders would go into a dated folder so that we could go back once that date was done, open up that folder and go through and then update that spreadsheet and add um, the views that were taken, the data was taken, and who photographed it. This is just another way to keep track of um, the work that was being done. Um, and then the, the workstation that we were using to do the photography wasn't equipped with file micro, which is what we use for our database. So instead of photographing a fish and walking down the hall, sitting down on the computer and entering the information, it made much more sense to just kind of wait until those specimens were uploaded, or when Mark was uploading the, the data, and just do it then rather than, than do it as we go. Um, so that's, that's sort of our workflow that we, that we worked out. Um, and then, as far as the equipment goes that we use, we're, we're using a Nikon D90 with a <coughs> Nikon Micro Nikkor 60 millimeter macro lens. Um, and, and software was a Nikon camera, yeah, Nikon Camera Control Pro 2, Helicon Focus Light, and uh, that was all connected to an Apple iMac. 